Something that used to be entirely dominated by closed source AI and LLMs was programming. Initially, it was thought that only big models like GPT-4 and Cloud Opus were actually capable of being used for complex programming. Things like asking them to build you an entire website or do anything more impressive than just writing a snake game and then seeing what comes out. However, we've started to see massive advancements. Deep Sea Coder was the first model that really showed us this could be done and Llama 3 improved marginally, but generally was focusing in other areas and being good at programming was just one of those. Google's Gemini 1.5 and 1.5 Pro showed us some new things that you could do with a massive context window, but we quickly realized that although this was sort of another incremental improvement in performance, it wasn't necessarily something that could replace all developers. And well, we all know what happened with Devin. And today we got something entirely new, novel and state of the art from the company that I think has given us some of the most interesting and groundbreaking open source advancements in large language models. And specifically that's Codistrol from Mistral AI, the uh, infamous French AI startup that has just been killing it lately. So what is this model? Does it actually perform better than Deep Sea Coder 33B and Llama 370B. Can you use it right now? Where can you use it for free? We're gonna get into all this in this video. So welcome to AI Flux, let's get into it. So I wanna thank Maxime Lebon for putting together a really great high level overview of why this model is so good. And we're gonna hop into the blog from Mistral in just a few minutes. So, so Maxime nailed this in this first sentence, basically saying that Codistrol is quite exciting. It's the first time I've seen a code LLM handle both instructions and fill in the middle. So for those of you who have maybe used GitHub Copilot or any number of other tools that let you use a LLM to help you code, you'll know that a lot of them are either kind of question answer so either they're only there to kind of answer certain questions or they're really only there to be a hyper-focused, uh, souped up kind of autocomplete where they always just want to finish the last, I don't know, 15 to 20% of what you're writing or recommend a function that you don't want at all. So what's interesting is kind of what fill in the middle actually is. So fill in the middle has showed up in a number of academic papers. And basically what this is, it's like in painting, but it's for code and programming. So the idea is, let's say you're learning something or you're starting out with just pseudocode, which is just kind of really high level stuff, like all the functions you want, but maybe not entirely filled in. Basically, if you provide those to Codistrol, it will just fill those in for you. And to have this all happen in one model is really pretty interesting. And one thing I'm kind of curious to look at is if it'll be able to really do kind of multi-file reasoning, which for programming is kind of the equivalent of multi-step reasoning. So understanding that you need a certain set of files, and then if you need to tweak something in one of them to get a desired output or fix a bug, understanding which of those files you're pointing to without just completely starting all over again, which actually is something that GPT-4 still does to this day. And it's a pretty easy way to get GPT-4.0 all mixed up. And at least from the benchmarks that we have from Mistral, it looks really good. It actually looks like it outperforms the excellent Deep Sea Coder 33B, which really, in my opinion, was the previous state of the art. And up until Codistrol was the current state of the art open source coding LLM. And what's crazy is that LLM is 50% larger. So this uh, Codistrol model is only 22 billion parameters compared to obviously Code Llama 70B Deep Sea Coder 33B and Llama 370B. And it's important to note that all of these also have a much smaller context window. So the benchmarks they picked are kind of interesting. And you'll notice that they explicitly test against Python because this is really what we have the most benchmarks on. SQL and then average on several other languages. Technically speaking, Codistrol actually supports up to 80 different programming languages. And I think it's starting to be cool that we're getting programming models that actually have enough cross-pollination across a number of programming languages. So for instance, not just functional languages or object-oriented languages and enough kind of web dev and common thing that it really starts to unlock a lot of capability. For instance, the first thing that really blew me away when it came to using GPT-4 for coding was actually using it to write scripts with FFmpeg and generating these really complicated filters that I probably could have ended up making, but it would have taken hours. And it's going to be really cool to see these models continue to evolve. And in my opinion, one of the most interesting comparisons here is the comparison of Codistrol 22B to Cloud3 Opus, specifically on human eval. And I'm actually having a video come out quite soon with 
an entire startup that's decided to take it upon themselves just to make um, private benchmarks for all of these models. Basically saying you submit a model to them, they benchmark it, and that's it. Um, because obviously, especially with our video yesterday covering the uh, 1 by 22 b mixtural, it's becoming apparent that, again, benchmarking is a much harder problem than people really maybe thought about. And that having any of these models be sort of open or eventually have loose ends in the open um, can compromise how well we can really benchmark any of these models. Again, for me, the big question is waiting for a few more evals to come out and help us understand how much better um, this actually is compared to these other models. But let's look at the Mistral blog to get a bit more information. So how does Mistral actually describe this model? They say, we introduced Codistril, our first ever code model. Codistrol is an open weight generative AI model explicitly designed for code generation tasks. So they weren't starting with an LLM and making good at coding or adding extra instruct fine tuning for coding. It was built from the ground up for coding. And I'm curious if they're going to mention where a lot of their data came for this. So they say it helps developers write and interact with code through a shared instruction and completion API endpoint. And again, the big key here is instruction and completion in one API endpoint. Um, for GitHub Copilot, they actually use two. And they say as it masters code and English, it can be used to design advanced AI applications for software developers. And the data set appears to be just programming languages, but obviously they had to get kind of snippets or something surrounding this to actually have some idea with English what's going on here. But they say Codistrol is trained on a diverse data set of 80 plus programming languages, including the most popular ones, such as Python, Java, C, C++, etc. It even performs on more specific ones like Swift and Fortran. So Fortran is a surprising one because I actually doubt a lot of that is even on the internet. The broad language base ensures Codistrol can assist developers in various coding environments and projects. And the biggest win, in my opinion, is explained right here. So they're claiming this saves developers time and effort, obviously maybe picking better design decisions. Um, but specifically, it can complete coding functions, write tests. Writing tests is a big one. So if you do QA, your job's going to get replaced by this. Uh, complete any partial code using a fill-in-the-middle mechanism as well. Interacting with Codistral will help level up developers' coding game and reduce the risk of errors and bugs. So one thing I'm really interested in is I'm going to deliberately ask it to make something that will break, and then I'm going to ask it to fix the bugs, um, because frankly, this is something that's pretty hard to do well with GPT-4. Now, another thing they're really big on is performance and just raw speed. So they say, as a 22B model, Codistral sets a new standard on the performance latency space for code generation compared to previous models used for coding. And frankly, I think the previous state of the art with this is either Deep Seek Coder 33B or specifically Llama 370B. Grok kind of throws a wrench in all this. And of course, you can run this on Grok, which I think is pretty cool. But the most interesting part of this relative to these benchmarks here, which again are mostly in Python, is that it has a much larger context window. And we know that big context windows help a lot because, you know, D Gemini said, yeah, this is why it's so good. You can feed an entire code base in and then we can tell you exactly what you need to know from that, um, basically removing the, the need for RAG entirely. And they make some interesting comparisons here. Uh, curiously, they're not comparing it to Cloud3 Opus and any of their internal benchmarks, so it'll be cool to see some evals on this coming soon. They said, we compared Codistrol to existing code-specific models with higher hardware requirements, um, likely for speed and just running them in general. So again, I mean, eval is really where they're focusing, and even across Python, JavaScript, Java, and just kind of a pseudocode general num number, there is a significant margin for Codistrol. So this is not the kind of thing where we're just seeing a few percentage points, we're seeing tens of percentage points in performance advantage to Codistrol 22B. One thing I've always really liked about Mistral is when they release models, they always make sure you can use them right off the bat quite easily. And this is no different with Codistrol. So they've released the weights open source. They also have used this moment to announce their new non-production license, which is a little weird because this is also an approach that Stability AI took, and I don't think Mistral is renting twice as many GPUs as they can afford. So I'm, I'm not really worried that this is you know spelling the end of Mistral AI. But um, yeah, they also have a dedicated endpoint, and the reason they do this is because they also sell this as like an API endpoint, and I think it's why Mistral is probably going to survive for so long, and why they've really been thriving, um, even though they're located in Europe, which from certain regulation occasionally makes doing AI things hard. But fortunately, Macron seems to be fully on board with making sure that Mistral has everything they need because it makes France as a kind of technical hub of Europe look really, really good. And as always, it's a model they just launched, so it's available on La Platform. And you can also use Codistrol on LeChat, which is pretty cool. And I think we're gonna see 
some really, really cool integrations and really, really cool projects and fine tunes coming from this. So I'm very, very excited. Now, uh, before we hop into the actual demo and where I'm gonna use this and try to break it, I think it's worth saying that you can use this right away. Like with Deep Sea Coder, it was very powerful, but it was really not clear how to use it. And what's really cool is right out the bat, there is a VS Code and JetBrains integration. And I'm curious to see if some of these other kind of AI first text editors actually end up picking up this as well, which is pretty cool. And there have been some pretty big names in the developer space that have also picked out this and said it's really cool. So I'm here in the La Platform interface and let's see how quick this is. So there are a few things I wanna see. One, how snappy this is relative to Llama 370B running on Grok. If this interface will actually let me do kind of the fill in the middle workflow and then seeing how it does with some more exotic languages like Lisp, Elixir, and OCaml. So let's see what we get here. So first I'm going to switch from Mr. Large to Code Stroll and let's start with something simple. So I'm going to say, Write a Python function Mandelbrot set. Wow, okay, it's fast. And I like that it gives you kind of the sequential output. So it's not just giving you a huge block of output. And similar to some other really capable coding models, it also understands that like, telling you what it's doing is also useful. So it says, sure, here's a simple Python function that generates the Mandelbrot set. This function uses the matplotlib library to visualize. So it's cool, it understands that I wanna see this. And it says here that the script will generate a plot of the Mandelbrot set in a complex plane from negative two to one and on X and negative 1.5 to 1.5 on Y. It tells me how I can adjust these and along is with you know a few other options. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to ask it, this is good, so I'm not saying it did something wrong. What if I wanted to, this is another question I've asked models before and some miss with this, or they either think I want to start from scratch entirely or give kind of a more simple implementation. Now, what's cool with this model is it clearly defaulted to something that was quite simple early on. So obviously this is still using uh, NumPy up here. And then down here, it's using a slightly different representation. Of course, this is less readable, but it makes sense that this model would actually default to the more readable version on the beginning. Um, so now what's interesting is this is a visual script or a visual function, and I want to see if it can write some tests. So I'm just going to say, can you write some tests? So we're going to see if, I don't think this can actually execute anything, but let's see here if it writes some test cases. So cool. Okay. It gave us five or six test cases, which is pretty cool. And all right, this is all pretty interesting. All right. So now I'm going to go to a new chat just to make sure everything is still good. And let's do some fill in the middle. So I'm going, to, I'm going to take a little bit of time to write some kind of pseudocode in Python and then see if this can fill in. Okay, so I took a little bit of time and might have used another LLM to actually generate this, but basically I've generated all the rough functions you would need for a snake game. So we're not generating a snake game, but we're giving it all of the functions it needs. And I think this is like eight different functions or so. So we have draw snake, draw food, move the snake and everything else we pretty much need. And now code Stroll has to decide how it wants to fill these in to make it work and then write a basic test. And again, it's gonna be interesting to see how it responds because this is a game, so you have to see what's going on. So the test cases it makes will be pretty interesting and it will all hinge on how it decides to actually implement this. So let's see what we get. Oh, wow, okay, cool. So it understands we wanna use Pygame. It sets some constants for screen size along with setting some arbitrary directions. Okay, wow, this is pretty cool. And this is pretty simple and readable too. What's interesting is it removed all of the comments. It's kind of interesting, but these test cases do look really good. Is it used a normal just coordinate plane based on the number of pixels, which is pretty cool. Um, now I'm gonna be kind of cheeky and I'm, I'm going to say, uh, could you add back in Great. Okay, so now it's going to add in some of these again. So again, it took out the function statements, which is kind of interesting, but I, oh, there we go. Actually, okay, it did put these back in, which is pretty cool. And wow, I will say this is better than Cloud Opus. I've used it, uh, cause I've actually had a free pass from a friend who knows one of the founders and Cloud is great, but the thing is, uh, it's not very good at doing larger files. Like one thing that I, I was surprised at how good Cloud was doing was I actually asked it in theory how it would do some pretty complex um, merges and fixes using Git. And it was actually really cool to see how well it really understood how that process works, especially in a multi-step fashion. Like I deliberately screwed up a uh, pull request that I had merged and then had a few other things merged into it. And it actually really helped. So I, I think in terms of interacting with things like Git, um, Cloud is really, really good, but this is completely wild. 
uh, especially the speed with it not running on Grok and the fact that in theory, uh, if with the right quants, you could definitely fit this on a 3090 or a 4090. So now I'm gonna move into some more exotic languages. So OCaml and Elixir are a little bit similar and I, I've, I've been learning OCaml because a friend of mine who works at Anduril has been kind of convincing me that it's like the better version of Elixir. And maybe someday we'll talk about Elixir because they've been trying to do a lot of um, LLM and kind of machine learning tooling with it. So those are very cool, but I wanna see if this knows how to use a platform called LiveView. So if you've done JavaScript stuff, you've probably heard of React, which is a really interesting web framework made by Meta. But LiveView works on an entirely different paradigm that I actually quite like, and it uses very little JavaScript. So I'm going to ask this to write a, a basic Twitter clone using Elixir and the LiveView web framework. And specifically, I'm going to push the English side of it by saying, um, so let's see if it freaks out or it gives us something good. All right, so it's giving us why we should use it first. Simpler code based, hot code reloading, etc. And it didn't give us any code. So uh, let me see, let's see if it gives us this. Okay, so it's giving us more implementation details. And that is helpful, but we still want some more code. So I'm going to say, uh, why don't you write the first few live view components for me? Let's assume, so it has to understand what Twitter is. It has to understand kind of the relative function and the relative formatting of that page. And it looks like we got some good stuff here. All right, so cool, we have mount, we have handle event, which we need, and then we have something that's making a change to a database. Now what's cool here is I'm actually going to ask it from this to figure out what it wants its data model to use. Um, and here we go. So we have a username, email, password, and then a number of tweets. And yeah, as someone who's used live view, this actually all looks pretty good. Now for something that's going to test kind of where the safety of all this is and to test how good this is with truly kind of niche languages, I'm now going to use kind of an Android-esque prompt. So um, let, let me do it this way. So I'm going to say, Let's say I want to write a basic implementation of terrain following guidance for my RC plane. So we'll see if it understands that I'm looking to build something that's kind of like a little more spicy. And let's see here. Okay, so yes, we understand it's a hard problem and Andrew gets that too. It's going to show us a simplified version and it's not freaking out that it's thinking that we're maybe using the RC plane for something else, but it understands that we need sensor data for where the plane is going, so altitude, orientation, and speed, and some way to actually ingest sensor data. And then this is basic flight control. I'm curious if they're gonna give us a really rough... All right, cool, so what's funny is they gave, they gave us a really basic PID loop here, which you would need to do this. So we have to see if it thinks we're using a camera or a radar, uh, let's see here. So follow path, data sensor data. Um, let me just say, what kind of data could this be? So the important thing is it needs to understand here that radar is good because it can actually actively sense acceleration. So we can tell what you're getting close to kind of in real time and at what rate that's happening. Uh, interesting. Okay, cool. So as long as we're getting object recognition and optical flow, that's all I was really looking for it to get. Awesome, and it showed us some streams as well. So this is really, really interesting. Um, I really quite like this. Um, for me, a lot of the more gritty um, applications here are more interesting than web dev stuff because with web dev, there are so many examples of how to do everything. And it, as interesting as it is, and as you know, maybe good or bad it is that we're going to replace a lot of web devs with tools like this or enable more web devs like this with tools like this. Um, it is interesting. So. I really think this is an impressive model just based on its speed and its general ability. Um, I, what I like about Mistral is they don't try to do everything. They try to do initially small things well and then they grow from there and they really deliver each time they do it. So I'm curious what you think. Are you gonna use this instead of Deep Sea Coder or something like Cloud3 Opus? Do you prefer GPT-4 still? Um, what does your AI kind of assistant coding flow look like generally? You know, I generally use cloud a lot in the past and I've recently been using more local LLMs with VS Code, but I'm really curious to see what you guys use. 
So let me know in the comments below. Let me know if you think Mistral is just completely um, faking evals with this. Uh, let me know what you think about the evals. But um, as always, I hope you learned something in this video. If you like our content, please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you in the next one.